Welcome back to our series of videos on lateral bracing, uh, which is another way of saying, in terms of the overall building, we call it resisting horizontal forces, which is a bit more explicit because there can be lateral bracing to all manner of structural members. And sometimes that lateral bracing is in the vertical direction. So we're talking about the overall behavior of the building under wind or seismic loads, and we're talking about resisting horizontal forces. And we have talked about uh, a variety of me measures for doing that. Right at the moment, we're talking about tall buildings. So we're going to talk about shear walls uh, in both a shear wall tube around the building, and then also something called the buttress core concept which was developed by Skid Moorings and Merrill. So here we have some sort of a structure uh, with some sort of lateral force on it, which might be wind or seismic. And we want to design a building that can resist that. So one of the ways we've talked about doing that is with some sort of triangulation. And the classic examples are the Alcoa building in San Francisco which was one of the early examples of a trust tube uh, for resisting lateral forces, which, by the way, are very severe in San Francisco because of seismic effects. But this basic strategy works really well even for resisting wind loads, which is why we also see it incorporated in the John Hancock building uh, in Chicago, where we have these large diagonal braces. We've also talked about moment frames, which we argue is a very attractive way of doing things. Even though it may be the least efficient from a structural point of view, it's the most adaptive from an architectural point of view because we don't have any cross bracing uh, through this bay that's going to interfere with movement of people uh, or, or vehicles or whatever in and out through those uh, portals. So the classic example of a tall, rigid frame structure is the Sears Tower. And we talked about the fact that these vertical elements are large um, welded up plate girders, in essence, or plate columns. Um, and then the horizontals are welded to them. And this is uh, full penetration welding, including these stiffeners. So in fact, when they get through grinding this down, you don't know whether this beam was the continuous element or that vertical was the continuous element. And the basic building block is outlined in blue here. Uh, it's a sort of double cross with two horizontals and one vertical. And the field connections were made through bolting right there and there and there and there and there and there. So all of these moment joints were very, very carefully fabricated in a shop environment where accuracy of a geometric nature, but also uh, really effective full penetration welds could be achieved. So this was an example of a moment frame tube around the boundary of the building. And in fact, in the case of the Sears Tower, it was nine bundled tubes together. And this is what that looked like uh, when it was finished off and the lower floors uh, entering into the lobby of the building. Now, we've talked about those topics already, so this particular video is going to focus on the third method of lateral stabilization, which is so-called shear walls. Shear walls have been with us for a very long time because uh, in ancient construction, we have used masonry uh, extensively. And in masonry, we can basically resist gravity loads, but we can also resist horizontal forces very effectively because of the sheer resistance of the walls, but also because of the mass of the masonry. The typical architectural expression of that is small punched openings which uh, I have certainly exaggerated here in order to make the point. So here you have some small openings which might occur in a masonry wall. And this masonry wall then could uh, 
resist the gravity forces as a bearing wall and also resist the horizontal forces of wind and seismic as a shear wall. And most of our architecture is expressed in this manner even in the modern day when we don't need it. In other words, in modern day construction where we have strong materials like steel, we can do a rigid frame like this and put in huge expanses of panoramic glass and that is one potential way of expressing architecture. A more conventional way though is this and this is more sort of uh, a pattern that we've fallen into in terms of the way we think about architecture. So we see kind of a dichotomy today where in residential construction we see uh, studs and oriented strand board or plywood used to create shear walls and bearing walls. And so housing architecture in the United States, especially single family houses, tends to mimic these models that we have from masonry, which were also bearing walls and shear walls. But right now we're talking about tall buildings. That's the topic of this particular lecture and how we stabilize tall buildings against horizontal forces. So we're gonna just jump to the extreme example. This is the tallest occupiable masonry building in the world. It's called the Monadnock Building and it's in Chicago, Illinois. And I've forgotten how many floors it is, something like 17 floors. And at the base of this building, the uh, cumulative forces are so extreme that these are solid walls, six feet thick. So this is at the base of the building, and this is all solid masonry from this edge all the way into that edge, which is, as I said, about six feet. It's an incredibly massive building, which actually is slowly burying itself into the ground because it basically is forcing uh, soil out from underneath it because of its enormous weight. But it is a working building. Um, the bottom floors don't have a whole lot of occupiable space because not only are the perimeter walls bearing walls, but all the interior walls are bearing walls and shear walls. They're all, all the walls in this building are bearing walls and shear walls. And they're all down at the base about six feet thick. So the net effect of this is that a large part of the bottom floor is occupied by structural material. Now, this was kind of a limit for how big we could practically build masonry structures because the structural stress capacity of, more, of masonry and more specifically of the mortar that's used between the bricks is not really great. And so we wouldn't be building buildings any taller than this except for two things. We have elevators today, but we also have drastically improved structural materials. So the steel that's necessary to hold up a building like this is a very tiny percentage of the floor area down at the bottom of the building, but the masonry that's required to hold it up is a very large percentage of the floor area. And this is a self-limiting process that means masonry construction can't be driven much taller than what we're looking at here. Okay, so that sort of classic architectural models carried to the extreme. We are using bearing walls made out of masonry and just driving it as high as we possibly can. With steel construction, we can go much higher and the columns don't consume such a large portion of the floor area. And we can even use shear walls for lateral stabilization. So this is an example. This is the New York Newsday building. I can say that in the late 60s and early 70s, there was a huge amount of political dissent in this country. And we had our own kind of homegrown uh, terrorist. And we also had a huge amount of paranoia about homegrown terror and it, terrorists. And this emerged to a large degree out of, out of uh, political strife over the Vietnam War, over which... Uh, most many Americans had huge differences of opinion. So some corporations actually took to building uh, 
uh, this kind of sheer wall tube, which basically is kind of sad because in the middle of a city like Manhattan, uh, where you could have wonderful views and daylight and a sense of inspiration, these people were living basically in what felt like a cave. Once they were inside this building, they had no sense that they were 20 stories up because it was an entirely opaque building. We can do a lot better than that, of course, and still have sheer wall construction. And this is a fairly famous example in Hong Kong. And I took this picture roughly 40 years ago. And by the way, all the scaffolding on this building is laced together bamboo. So one of the most intriguing things for me to, was to watch a huge number of high-rise buildings. And by high-rise, I mean 30, rough in the neighborhood of 30 stories. All of them, almost all of them going up with bamboo scaffolding uh, out of about 30 buildings that I saw at the time. All of them but one was being put up with bamboo scaffolding, which gives you some idea of how strong bamboo is and how versatile these workers were. The one other building was put up uh, using aluminum scaffolding. And I'm sure all that has changed dramatically over the last 40 years. But uh, this is kind of an intriguing example of really modern architectural construction being carried out in pretty ancient uh, techniques. So here we have uh, circular openings. And the notion here is that the circular opening is the least disturbing in terms of maintaining the shear wall capacity. When we cut rectangular or square openings, we end up with high degrees of stress concentration in the corners, uh, which we alleviate by doing these circular cuts. And we can actually think of this as a lot like, this is kind of a cross between a shear wall and a moment frame. So here's the moment frame from the Sears Tower. If we imagine drawing uh, circles or ellipses in here and filling in these corners with material, these corners are the most highly stressed part of the facade in the Sears Tower. And that's where most of the deformation is induced. And in the case of this concrete tower in Hong Kong, um, basically um, they filled in these corners and smoothed them out, which pretty radically reduced the amount of stress and the amount of deformation. Another thing to think about in terms of is the, the whole philosophical question of is this a shear wall or is it a moment frame? Uh, one of the ways I think of a shear wall is if I can trace a straight line along the diagonal, it's more like a shear wall than it is like a moment frame. Um, I don't know how many other people would agree with that way of thinking about it, but I have a hard time when I look at this building uh, answering the question, is it more in the nature of a rigid frame or is it more in the nature of a shear wall? And Typically, I come down on the side of, well, it's a whole lot like both of them, but if I had to pick, it's more like a shear wall because I don't have these corners that uh, interrupt a straight line for the diagonal stress material. So uh, a wall like this could actually have straight pieces of rebar that come up the wall that create the diagonalization uh, for resisting horizontal forces. So we can think of this as rigid frame, we can think of it as triangulated, or we can think of it as a shear wall. Um, but regardless of how we think of it, it is structurally very effective at resisting lateral forces. You'll notice the verticals are a little wider here. So this dimension across here is wider than that dimension there, which is consistent with the idea that this is not just a shear wall, but it's a bearing wall. And so we're going to have an accumulation of substantial amounts of gravity force as we move down towards the base of this building. This building uh, was fairly famous when it was first created. And in fact, it was part of one of the James Bond movies, which is kind of an indicator 
whatever building they use for the next Mission Impossible or the next James Bond is, uh, whatever is most in the consciousness of human beings, and this building was there for a while, uh, I think people were intrigued by the circular windows. It was a bit unusual all around. Um, it never caught on though, and I don't think I ever saw a really good replica or a, uh, an enhancement of it. And part of the reason was that the windows were a bit small. And I think most people who uh, live in really tall buildings or have offices in really tall buildings uh, would like to have panoramic windows and this building didn't quite do that. But from a structural logic point of view, it ranks extremely high and it actually has some pretty decent windows compared to some of our more classical architecture where we tend to have even tinier punched windows. So uh, here's another example of that basic concept. So here we have shear walls with punched openings and in this case they've even articulated, so this is, I think it is in Phoenix, and they've created these uh, cowlings that go over the windows that help provide some shading. All right, so this leads us to the most current um, evolution in the shear wall, and I, I want to emphasize that uh, one concept is a tube, which is either this, which is quite horrifying, or that, which has some pretty decent windows but isn't great. So what we're looking for is we're looking for some kind of shear wall concept or combination of shear wall and bearing wall, which allows really great windows. So one of our motives for putting most of our material on the outside in the form of a tube was to give ourselves the maximum uh, in resisting moment for overturning forces such as wind or seismic. Um, and so it's always been a question of how do we reconcile the conflict between that tubular shear wall on the outside of the building and our desire for views and light. And the Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill team came up with the solution to that, which was something called the buttress core. And it was used in the Burj Dubai. And the buttress core basically has these uh, bearing walls and shear walls that come out in three directions. They could have come out in four directions and the thing would have been even more stable. Uh, but then people in an apartment right here would have had a lot of view of people over there and vice versa. So from a privacy point of view, they didn't want to use the, uh, the cruciform uh, footprint and instead they used this three-legged column um, where these walls are called the buttressing elements. And they're very similar in, in a sense to the buttresses flying buttresses on a Gothic cathedral. And here we have more of those walls and here more. And they have to create a really good footprint uh, to spread out and give you a stable base. Once that's been accomplished though, then instead of having all these shear walls around the boundary of the building, we're getting the wide footprint by just extending this outward in these three directions in order to give us a good stable base. Uh, it does require a fair amount of land because the footprint is, is uh, extending off uh, in a sort of radical way in these three directions. Works great in Dubai. It would be less appealing in some place like Manhattan where people are looking to take advantage of every square foot of some tiny little uh, square lot in the heart of the metropolis. So in the case of this building, by the way, at the base, these bearing walls and buttress elements uh, get to be two feet thick. If I recall correctly, the concrete stress capacity for this material was around 9,000 pounds per square inch, and I think it was made out of fly ash, Portland cement, and water. Uh, 
it was a pretty simple concoction uh, that had pretty high stress capacity. Um, the forming of all of this, well, before I mention that, by the way, these buttress core elements can have a tendency to buckle to the side. And we talked about torsional lateral buckling when we talked about column failure. And one of the things we said was the cruciform shape or these wings extending out extensively produces an inherently non-compact section which has a tendency to torque down. So we showed that behavior in a cruciform. We showed it in, um, in uh, simple angles. And this building, of course, would have that problem except for two things. One is this tubular core is providing the torsional capacity that's keeping this uh, torsional failure from occurring. In addition to that, these buttressing elements are stabilized by what I'm going to call wing walls. I can't remember exactly what SOM calls these, but these are wing walls, which also serve as bearing walls. And this is what I find astounding about this building is it's unbelievably simple to build. It's unbelievably simple as a concept and it's super efficient. This is a slab floor, which is eight inches thick. It spans from that wall to that wall, which is roughly 30 feet. That eight inch thick concrete slab can accommodate everything, including the J traps, uh, having to do with the plumbing sewage lines. So you end up with a, an eight inch thick interstitial volume between uh, one unit and the unit above or the unit below. So from a volumetric efficiency point of view, it's incredibly simple. But here's another thing that's really kind of awe-inspiring to me is that in spite of the fact that this building is unbelievably tall, every one of these bearing walls can be traced all the way to the base, as is the case with these buttressing elements. And as a consequence, there are no girders, there are no spanning members anywhere in the system except that slab. Um, so with a simple slab, which is very easy to form, and these vertical bearing walls, such as these buttressing walls or these bearing walls or wing walls, uh, they're able to slip form the structure up with amazing efficiency. Um, and those just as it's easy to slip form it up, it carries the forces in a very efficient and direct manner all the way to the foundation. This building, by the way, um, during the 40 years prior to this building, each of the incremental improvements eventually raised the height of buildings about 22%. This building in one quantum leap raised the height of the high-rise building by 60%. It provides fabulous floor-to-ceiling views, wonderful sense of access to the outside. So if you're in your space here that's roughly 30 feet from there to there, and it's 30 feet from there to there, you're never very far from a window, which is about 11 feet high. So you get great views, great light. One interesting thing here is that to provide flexibility, there are openings in these wing walls, which allows somebody to buy and occupy several of these units. And if you're wealthy enough, you can do that. Um, one slight downside to that is that even though these openings are small, they're the height of a door, and even though there's a fair amount of material crossing over, there is some shear lag between this material, which is working very effectively in compression, and this material, which is a little less effective because of deformation that occurs along this, this vertical uh, zone, which has openings in it. So even though all this material, all these wing walls and all these buttressing walls,
are working under, say, wind load, uh, tending to drive this portion of the building down into the foundation, this portion of the material is not as significant in its contribution as that portion. And I'll mention in, in the next case study um, why that turns out to be a significant issue. So this was Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill's proposal for the next super high rise, which was going to substantially exceed the Burj Dubai. And let me go back, by the way, and make a couple of comments on the Burj Dubai. You'll notice how it's stepped back. So there's a whole series of these step backs, and they are um, accomplishing two major things. One is they're adding visually to the richness of it, but they are also confusing the vortex shedding. So the vortex shedding that's occurring down at this level of the building will be dramatically different in its frequency from what's happening up here. So this whole step back strategy um, is, is to me quite amazing because in fact, the cross-section of this entire portion is constant. The cross-section of that entire portion is constant. In other words, the floor plans are identical and everything is extruded up. But by stepping it back in this seemingly random manner, they've created uh, a visually very complex structure that feels like a parabola. In fact, when I first looked at this, I said, well, this is a parabola that's going up that side and there's a parabola coming down this leg. And when I asked the people at SOM, I said, did you actually put steel along that parabola? And they said, there is no parabola there. It's basically extruded upward and it's just fooling the eye into believing that. So all these walls over a certain vertical dimension will be constant and the steel rebar just runs vertically and horizontally, but it doesn't follow any particular contours. Okay, so there was an incredibly rich study about vortex shedding and the natural frequencies of the structure, and they did a number of really interesting things, one of which is to make the structure slender enough, excuse me, I got lost here, that its natural frequency actually is much longer than the natural frequency for uh, any of the vortex shedding or for any of the seismic events. So they've kind of detuned the building. So there are a number of different ways that this structure has been very elegantly worked out from a structural point of view. Okay, so in the Kingdom Tower proposal, instead of using a, a lot of step backs, they've continuously tapered it, which accomplishes the same thing from a vortex shedding point of view. Um, it means that the footprint uh, might be constantly changing, which adds some complexity. But in the case of this building, uh, some of the, uh, ver the vertical circulation has to be offset. In other words, you'll do some vertical circulation um, in a certain portion of the building, which then has to be shifted over when you get to a major step in this case, they've put all that vertical circulation gently tracking along the slope of this building, so it's not necessary to make any transfers. So this building is very similar to the Burj Dubai, except for that continuous taper. And one other thing here, you'll recall we mentioned that there are these doorways which create some shear lag, which means this material is not quite as effective in the case of the Kingdom Tower, they basically said, okay, uh, we don't actually need that much material to stiffen these buttressed cores. And maybe rather than put in doorways that create shear lag, we'll just create the continuous connection between units out at the perimeter of the building, which gives you even more dramatic panoramic views and a greater sense of openness. So this is bearing wall that goes all the way to the base. This is cantilever out to the facade of the building. And what's amazing about that is it not only gives you this greater sense of openness and greater connectivity between units, 
um, but it actually works more efficiently structurally. It's hard to believe that cantilevering out and bringing all that back to this interior wall works better, but it does because basically this material wasn't working that well anyway because of the shear lag that was occurring wherever these openings occur. So these openings have been moved to the perimeter of the building and that led to the footprint of the design for the Kingdom Tower. So this is the state of the art in terms of super high rise, uh, shear walls, stabilized uh, buildings, which the, the leading example that's actually been realized is the Burj Dubai, but this is a similar concept, which was for the Kingdom Tower. So that concludes our video on shear wall, laterally stabilized tall buildings, where we've talked about shear wall tubes and all the problems associated with that. And we've also talked about the buttress core concept developed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill.